Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for our uh, weekly uh, NC Child coronavirus related update. Uh, we truly uh, hope that everyone is staying well as well as you can during this um, this period of time. It, we know it's really hard and stressful in a lot of different ways. Um, and we're hoping today that we can just continue to hopefully shed some light around um, some of the policy issues related to the coronavirus and what's going on at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as get um, some good updates and get some of your great ideas as well. Um, I just wanted to real quickly uh, mention the, the agenda for the call here today. Um, we're gonna have a few different folks uh, sharing information with us. Um, we're happy to once again have Matt Gross on the call uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he's going to talk to us about what's been going on with the department this past week um, in, in relation to this. Um, and then Michelle Hughes, our executive director, is going to be uh, reviewing uh, some, some issues related to early education and an emergency package that's, that's emerging um, on that front. Um, then Whitney is going to update us all on the recent federal uh, relief legislation that was passed, uh, phase three of, of the coronavirus federal response. Um, there's a lot in that two trillion plus dollar piece of legislation that the U.S. House is uh, reviewing and I think voting on today. Um, then Ashley Perkinson with Perkinson Law Firm and also lobbyist for NC Child is going to be talking about the North Carolina legislative outlook. And then we want to go over some recommendations that we have been coming up with at NC Child along with many of your all's help um, that we'd like to send into legislators. And we'll be reviewing that package, uh, kind of giving an overview or outline of that and then sharing information about how you can sign on and review that as well. Last but not least, we wanna uh, get some updates and questions from y'all here on the phone. Um, so without any further ado, by the way, if you have questions, please put those in the chat box. Um, Fawn Patterson will be uh, kind of ministering the call again. Uh, thank you, Fawn. And uh, let's just go ahead and kick it over here to Matt Gross. Hi there, everybody. Thanks for having me again. Adam, can you hear me okay? Yeah, if you could speak up just a little bit. Okay, sure. Is that a little better? Yes. All right. Well, you asked to give an update on what has been going on at DHHS. It's probably easier to say what hasn't been going on at DHHS. Let me start with one area where we put out some new guidance uh, middle of the week that I'm sure a lot of folks have an interest in, and that's in the childcare space. So I know one of the things that we're very, very concerned about is the childcare industry as a whole. We know that that's such an incredibly critical service that's provided. What we've seen as I reported last week, we saw that over half the centers in the state have already closed. Of the centers that are remaining open, we're seeing really roughly between only 30 to 40 percent of the children are showing up there but we know that this is a critical service needed for medical providers first responders folks that are working in the food supply system a lot of other critical areas so we've made some changes that i'll admit are increasing some of the requirements particularly around uh, safety and sanitation but also increasing some funding of going to child care centers based on what we have with available resources. So really, these changes are aimed at four goals. One is we are trying to ensure that all child care programs that are running, uh, remaining open, are meeting health and safety guidelines to protect children, family, and child care workers from the spread of COVID-19. We are trying to stabilize a sufficient supply of licensed child care and school-based care to meet the needs of critical workers who have no other choices. We know that, frankly, in some ways, it's spread out a little bit too far right now, and we don't feel like we are in the business of picking who should stay open and who should close. Uh, it, it, it's going to need to probably naturally pare down a little bit more so we have the good numbers in these places so it's sustainable. Additionally, with that, we are providing financial assistance to low and moderate income critical workers who need child care now and aren't currently on the child care subsidy program. And the one thing that created a little bit of confusion um, is there was a version of this that first came out that said, if you're not, if you're a pre-K classroom and you're not providing pre-K, 
then you're not going to get funded starting, I think, in April. We quickly changed that because the recognition that for other teachers were getting paid through the rest of the year, this would mean pre-K teachers didn't get paid. So we are going to continue to make sure that pre-K teachers get paid through the rest of the year. Um, and then along with that, we're also looking at um, uh, a $300 per month bump for all teaching staff and $200 per month bump for non-teaching staff. I realize that's not a ton of money and that our childcare workers deserve a heck of a lot more than that, but it is what we can do with our current resources. Um, you know, one of the things that I hope this time, you know, I think we all wonder what our country is going to look like when we're done with this. And one of the things that I hope this will jumpstart is a conversation so many of us have been trying to have for a while, which is that childcare teachers are critically important professionals who do not get paid enough, do not have access to health care, and without them, so many of our critical functions as a society fall apart. I think that's becoming really apparent to folks in this moment, and I hope that, well, on one hand, I feel for the child care workers who continue to not, not make a lot, put themselves in harm's way to be, frankly, as critically important as all the, the first-line responders working on this. I hope this will jumpstart that conversation and be a thing people can point to to recognize, like, these are professionals that we need to be taking more seriously and treating uh, better than they've been treated uh, up until this point. So I wanted to start with child care there. I say on other fronts, we got our initial uh, 1135 Medicaid waiver approved. We're continuing to work with uh, CMS on some additional flexibilities. They've actually been really great to work with. They pointed to some things that other states had done that we didn't think to put forward. So we're working with that. The Medicaid team had a call with CMS last night. I haven't gotten a readout on it yet, but they've been working well with us. Also the USDA, which up until last night was being really disappointing and their lack of responsiveness and frankly in some ways the barriers they're putting up on a lot of the food waivers gave suddenly just a, essentially a blanket waiver last night so our staff's going through what that means but a lot more options on the food front that we didn't have 24 hours ago so we're excited about that um, but really a lot of work a lot of planning for upcoming hospital surge you may have seen already if you haven't the governor's going to have a press conference at four o'clock today about additional actions we are taking to slow the spread of COVID-19. Um, you know, I think it's, we're certainly, on one hand, I'm optimistic. We've seen a lot of progress. I've, we've gotten, I've gotten so many solicitation offers sent to us from every angle for potential access to PPE, manufacturers that want to make uh, PPS, personal protective equipment for frontline workers, folks that want to try to make pieces to help ventilators go to multiple people. That being said, as we've seen everywhere where this is hit, Hospital capacity is going to be a concern and more we can do to flatten the curve, the better. And it's critically important. We're seeing scenes tragically in New York and Michigan and other places that are starting to look a little uncomfortably like what we saw in Italy and really wanting to make sure that doesn't happen here. I worry a lot about rural, really every part of the state, but you look at some of the rural areas where I think maybe folks are looking at the counts and saying, well, we don't have many cases. We don't have to worry. Well, those are the places where there's even fewer hospitals. And frankly, as we know from the data, people that tend to have more underlying health conditions that make them more at risk. So we're still really worried about people all across the state. But uh, again, pay, keep your eyes open for the four o'clock announcement today. Um, but with that, I'm happy to stop and take whatever questions y'all have. And folks, Thanks if you so have much, questions Matt. for Matt, please type them into the chat box. In the meantime, Matt, I'll just say again, we really appreciate what you and the folks at DHHS are doing, working around the clock on this, and hope you'll continue to let us know as advocates what we can do to be supportive. Yep, absolutely. Um, so I see one, can I repeat the bonus pay to children? Yes, so, and I can send this guidance to uh, the folks at NC Child to, to put out, it's, it's on our website right now, but what, what it is is, DHHS will pay bonus payments to all full-time childcare employees in April and May of this year. We'll pay $300 per month for all teaching staff and $200 per month for all non-teaching staff. And that's for April and May for all programs that meet the new health and safety requirements and can stay open. I think a piece of that too is they need to be open to, um, they will be available. I think they will also need to remain open to serve, you know, new folks they don't currently serve 
And one of the things we're worried about is going to make sure there's access to care for our first responders and other folks. Again, I think of, I think as much about them, I think about the folks that are working at grocery stores and in the, the, the food pipeline that's critical. But that's it. I'll send a link out to folks where you can see it on the DHHS website. I can read the next question down. Matt, can you clarify the Medicaid mental health by telehealth changes? Does that cover NC Health Choice as well? And this is from Greg Borum in Western NC. What advice should we give to families and children in our area? That's a great question. Let me double check how it impacts NC Health Choice. I don't want to speak out of line and I actually don't know for certain. So let me double check that with our, with our team. I say the best advice to folks is take social distancing seriously. I know that's really hard with young kids. I know that having a uh, four-year-old whose birthday party was, we hung out in the cul-de-sac and then dropped off cake in his friend's mailboxes. Um, and a 16-month-old who's dead set on wrecking the house, but I think it's really important to social distance. And that doesn't mean, you know, that still go outside. Thankfully, it's warming up, enjoy nature. Um, you know, the new guidance that came up from the CDC and from us is that people who are not in one of the at-risk categories, which again is defined as being over 65 and with a underlying health condition. If they think they are, if they're symptomatic and think they have COVID-19, the best thing to do is to stay home. Um, going and getting a test at this stage of the process doesn't change the course of treatment and it uses up some of the valuable personal protective equipment that we're trying to save. So particularly for younger families with younger children, if, if you think you have this, stay home and isolate as if you do. You know, you can of course call your medical professional. Um, if your symptoms worsen and they become more than mild, then I certainly call a medical professional. If you need emergency care, absolutely access that. But if you have mild symptoms at this stage, just stay home and isolate and then try to be creative. I know there's a lot of online resources that are coming up to help entertain children. Uh, a lot of musicians are like are doing concerts. One's actually doing a, a, an intentional concert series at noon on Saturdays for kids. Um, a lot of resources out there, but that's my best advice on that front. I'll double check on the NC Health Choice uh, information as it regards to telehealth. Also check with your private payers. I know the private payers are really trying to step up telehealth opportunities as well. And I'll try to get a, a fact sheet out to y'all that you can also distribute to your network about telehealth. I know we put one together, but I don't have it at my fingertips. Great, thanks. We have a question from Heather Bros. Is DHHS looking at making any funds available for non-licensed youth programs? Um, not to my knowledge, it would probably be good to get a sense of what not, I mean, that's a, that's a broad umbrella. Our focus at this time is really looking at trying to prop up the, the licensed sector um, that already exists. But again, happy, happy to visit any ideas that folks have. And I think Heather was specifying boys and girls clubs. I don't know of any offhand, but I can check. Great, we have a question from Melissa Johnson. Will child care centers be able to get small business loans or grants to stay viable? Um, and we're, you know, there's examples from other states of states uh, asking parents to keep paying tuition even if closed, um, et cetera. Um, let me check on the small business loan side. That's over in Department of Commerce, I can ask that. I will say as far as our guidance around parents paying um, child care centers. So our guidance to centers has been if they can to not require parents who aren't using the service to pay. And if, and we're also asking that they try to hold slots for when children come back. We recognize that that's not, an, that's not viable from an economic standpoint for a lot of centers and families. So we're really hoping folks will use their best judgment. Um, yeah, as we know, if centers don't get paid, teachers don't get paid. But I also recognize that there's a lot of families right now that don't need care. In many cases have lost jobs and are also having economic struggles. This is one of those kind of all in this together and folks need to figure out what makes the most sense for them economically. But I'll check on the small business loan piece specifically as it pertains to child care centers. Okay, great. And we have some questions about NC Pre-K. This is from a school director. NC Pre-K is in private settings only in their county, Brunswick County. They're still looking for clarification. Can children physically go to an NC Pre-K classroom to receive instruction at this time with the governor's request for public school closure? Yes, if it's in a private setting, my understanding is they can still go to an NC Pre-K classroom in a private setting. Great. Uh, if we have a question from Meb and Boyd, has any thought been put into checking in on children who are at risk for child abuse and neglect? What's going on with that sector? Um, I know there's been a lot of work in the DSS space in terms of what level of that guidance has been given to local county DSS. I don't know, but I can check and follow up. 
I don't see any more questions coming in for Matt. Does anybody else have questions before? I will we say up? you're clearly asking good questions and not the ones the legislators are asking because that list of 800 questions I have memorized. So thank you for <laughs> thinking outside the box and in a different space than a lot of our elected <laughs> officials. And I'm really glad that uh, nobody asked me about whether or not they can get takeout from the restaurant because you can. Please get takeout. <laughs> Right. Thanks again, Matt. We Thanks. really appreciate you uh, being on with us and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. And stay tuned for four o'clock. Thanks. Bye. Yes. All right. Um, so next, we're going to kick it over to Michelle Hughes, our wonderful executive director, who is going to talk some about some more about um, some emerging recommendations related to early education. Michelle. Sure, and I'm not going to um, belabor this because Matt covered um, a good a good chunk of this. But just so folks know, um, NC Child in uh, following our partners, the North Carolina Early Education Coalition and the North Carolina Association for the Education of Young Children, earlier this week called for Governor Cooper and Secretary Cohen to actually close childcare centers across North Carolina and then reopen and establish emergency childcare centers. That, um, and resource them so that, that they have the appropriate equipment, food, protective gear in order to operate safely and keep kids and teachers healthy. Um, so as you can hear from Matt, what, we, what the uh, department has at this time is as of April 1st, childcare centers um, will have to submit an application to continue to operate they have to meet a certain set of standard, um, standardized health protocols and agree to um, follow those protocols. And they need to be open um, for essential workers, the children of essential workers. They are, as Matt said, going to be getting some bonus pay. Um, and there's also an application that will be coming out for parents who are essential workers in order to receive child care, emergency child care subsidy. Um, and so look for that next week. So if you are in touch with critical workers defined as health care workers, first responders, law enforcement, um, that definition is on the departmental website. There is an application um, so that you can try to enroll your child into one of the emergency centers that will be operating um, after April 1st. Um, and so uh, if you have not sort of bookmarked on your web uh, site or on your computer, the COVID-19 uh, departmental page, that is where all of this uh, information is being listed, uh, guidance from DCDEE and guidance um, from other departments um, and changes in different uh, rules and regulations and sort of emerging news in terms of how the department is responding to this crisis. Um, I am gonna leave it at that unless there are any questions. Again, all of this guidance is on um, the departmental website, but I just wanted to highlight it. Um, I think what I, the last thing I would say is that um, Matt is 100% right, that we are looking at, I think, a very frightening situation with early education. What we know nationally is that a third of the child care centers that were surveyed by the National Association of Education of Young Children reported that if they were closed for two or more weeks, they would not be able to reopen. They simply don't have the capital to be able to reopen once they close. So when we get to the other side of this pandemic, um, you are really looking at what could be the collapse of the early education system in North Carolina and across the, the country, really. And so we need to be addressing um, the emergency that we are in for childcare providers, for essential personnel, for children, and at the same time, we need to be begin to think about how we are gonna rebuild the system and how are you going to rebuild the system with an eye towards financing it in a way that people can make a living wage, can get benefits if they are teachers, and that really shows the value of early education teachers and programs to our state and our communities and our economy. So NC Child is partnering with others, our Early Education Coalition and others to begin that conversation. Um, it seems 
weird to be doing it in a crisis, but I think we need to start thinking about it right now in order to be able to kind of come out on the other side of this in a better place um, than where we were before this pandemic, quite honestly. So that's all stop there and we'll see if there's any questions. Well, Michelle, I was just going to quickly say, too, I know that, you know, we're going to go over our kind of outline of legislative recommendations near the end of the call, which will include those related to early ed, which we're working in in combination with uh, Early Education Coalition, et cetera. But do you want to just highlight a couple of uh, top line sort of asks or, you know, the, the funding sort of levels we're talking about in that um, that package through NCEEC? Sure. Um, I will answer one question that I see in the chat and then I will okay. get to the recommendation. Um, at this time, my understanding is that the department is not supporting any unlicensed pop up programs um, for childcare. I know that there's been a lot of hospitals and communities that are assessing the needs of their provide of their healthcare workers and uh, essential workers in their community. Um, and have been looking at trying to establish sort of pop-ups or uh, kind of child care in the hospital setting or outside. At this point, the department is not supporting any new unlicensed child care um, to, to meet those needs. Um, and uh, is there any similar discussion about domestic violence centers, uh, which are at risk of not being able to reopen once they close? Um, another good question. I do not know about that, but we can find out about the domestic violence shelters. That's a, a good question. And then Adam, let me do this. Let me turn it back over to you. And then once mm -hmm. we start going through the legislative recommendations, I can go through what okay. our legislative recommendation versus doing it now. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Michelle. And uh, next, we are going over to Whitney Tucker, our research director, who is going to give us a summary of this gigantic uh, coronavirus uh, stimulus bill package that, uh, again, is still moving through Congress, but is, if not going to get finalized and signed by the president today, I think that will happen tomorrow. Um, and it's just massive with a lot of moving parts, but Whitney is going to try to walk us through a quick summary. Thanks for the handoff, Adam. Um, can you guys hear me all right? Give me a thumbs up if volume's good. Okay. So as Adam said, this is massive. This bill um, is 883 pages. So I'm gonna just preface all of this with, I don't know all of the things yet, but we're working on it. Um, the Senate approved what is um, called the CARES Act on Wednesday. It's an acronym for Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. And it's around $2 trillion um, in stimulus for the country, the largest stimulus that we have ever passed, if it does actually get all the way through the House and to the president, which it's expected to do. So these are just a few um, top line highlights of what's in the package. But again, there is a lot more um, that, you know, if you guys have very specific questions, I can look into for you based on the bill language that we have so far. So the bill's biggest line item is $500 billion toward a lending fund for corporations and industries. This is what you've probably heard in the news as the bailout for, um, for you know, airlines and such. Uh, there's actually 58 billion of that 500 that's specifically set aside just for airlines, including a really controversial $17 billion in aid specifically for Boeing. Um, there is an oversight structure that's built into the bill for this lending fund, and it includes a committee of legislators and a special inspector general just for this fund. And um, the loans will all be publicized within two weeks after the bill is passed. There's $367 billion in this for small business loans that employers can use to pay salaries for employees earning up to 100K and also some emergency grants. So I heard a question earlier about small business loans to childcare facilities. And so this is really relevant to you guys, um, both for-profit and nonprofit childcare businesses with fewer than 500 employees will be eligible to apply for these small business loans up to $10 million and um, within that loan, uh, eight weeks of monthly payroll, mortgage and rent, um, and utility payments will be eligible for forgiveness. 
So that's good news. Um, there's also $3.5 billion in grants to states through the Child Care Development Block Grant, CCDBG, um, for immediate assistance to child care providers to prevent them from going out of business and to otherwise support child care for families, including all the frontline workers and first responders. The bill creates a $150 billion coronavirus relief fund for state, local, and tribal governments. And the um, distribution of that 150 billion is based on population. So we actually know how much North Carolina is estimated to get. And it's going to be a little bit over $4 billion. Of that 4 billion, 45% of our and any state's funds are set aside for local governments with populations over 500,000 people. Uh, more than $7 billion is set aside for affordable housing and homelessness assistance programs with another 900 million for the um, low income home energy assistance program to help lower people's um, household costs for heating and cooling, which we know is gonna become more of a problem as this drags on into the summer, especially. Um, there's $130 billion for hospitals to be used for personal protective equipment and telemedicine and um, expanding research and treatments for the virus. There's $250 billion in expansions to unemployment insurance benefits. So this is um, actually super important. The legislation creates a completely new program called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, the PUA, which you might start seeing pop up as an acronym all over the place. Um, this program provides help for workers that don't qualify for usual state unemployment benefits, and it can also complement state benefits for some people, um, depending on income levels and their specific circumstances. So, it provides payment to people who are self-employed, to independent contractors, gig workers, and people who are on regular state unemployment and have exhausted the time limit for that. The bill temporarily expands unemployment insurance to people who would like to work, but can't because they're sick or because they're caring for a family member who is sick with coronavirus, including people who are self-employed or who don't have really extensive work history. Um, the PUA provides these unemployment insurance benefits for up to 39 weeks, um, which is huge because our average in North Carolina for unemployment um, benefits is much lower than the national average. That's around um, 28, and we actually have 8.7 weeks. So um, an, an extension to 39 weeks is a really big difference for our workers. Um, also, under these unemployment insurance provisions in the bill, lower income people on um, unemployment insurance are eligible for an extra $600 per month in pay for four months from April through July 31st. And um, this doesn't apply to upper income earners, but it would ensure that lower income workers get a full salary and not just the two third pay that is um, often what they get under regular state um, unemployment insurances, at least for a third of the year. Right, and um, the provision is not retroactive and it starts in April. So that's a big difference. Um, there's also $250 billion for direct one-time payments to many individuals and families. You guys have probably heard lots about this on the news. Um, so this would provide a $1,200 payment to individuals, $2,400 for married couples, plus $500 for each dependent child under age 17. Payments phase out for individuals with um, gross incomes over 75K or $150,000 for couples. And anyone who makes more than $99,000 just would not get a payment at all. Um, money is expected to go out by April 6th. And that's, you know, well and good. It is a one-time payment. So, you know, not as great as it could be. But um, there are some really important caveats even to that one-time payment. Um, although the payment will not come through a tax rebate, which we really like because people need the money right now, uh, folks will need to have filed a tax return in 2018 or 2019 in order to receive that payment. So folks who didn't file a tax return, which is a fair number of people, um, will be eligible if they file one retroactively. And so that includes, for example, um, people who um, have a disability ID number, an SSDI, right, and want to go back and retroactively file, they're, they're going to be lumped in if they do that. The provision does not apply to undocumented immigrants and only applies to documented immigrants who have a tax identification number, so a TIN number. 
Um, if the tax filer doesn't have a TIN, a social security number, or an SSDI number, they can't receive this benefit, even if the children in their household do have that identification, which is really common in mixed status immigrant households. We have a lot of families where the parent might not have that identification number, but the child is a US citizen. Those families aren't eligible for this payment now. Um, it's also worth noting that this additional income won't impact asset limits or income limits that individuals need to um, qualify for other programs like SNAP or Medicaid. Other provisions that um, weren't huge line items but are really worth noting, there's $750 million um, for grants to all Head Start programs to help them respond to coronavirus related needs for children and families. Um, there's $400 million in election security grants to prevent and prepare for and respond to coronavirus in the 2020 federal election cycle. Um, the states must provide some accounting to the Election Assistance Commission of how those funds were spent within 20 days of any 2020 election, which is you know, some oversight that they tried to build, it, um, build in there. And then um, for context though for you guys, that funding, that 400 million is far less than what was requested by the states that will wanna set up vote by mail systems. So it would definitely be insufficient for that sort of a response um, as we you know, lean into election cycle. Um, it also, the bill also extends the real ID deadline for full implementation from October 1st of this year to September 30th of next year. So if you haven't gotten your real ID, then you know, you're in luck. Uh, we have a little bit of an extension on that. Um, and then a couple more things. The bill provides that anyone who needs extra money as a result of the economic impact of the virus will be allowed to withdraw from their retirement accounts without getting hit by a 10% fee. And also, um, it doesn't include any student loan forgiveness, but it does have some more minor provisions on debt. And students with federal loans can suspend their payments until September 30th, interest free. And um, students who have to drop out of school because of coronavirus also don't have to pay loans for that time. So, you know, lots of really helpful things. Um, everybody didn't get everything that we did want um, for families and for children, but there are definitely some big steps forward here, especially when it comes to protecting workers who are found themselves really unexpectedly out of work on a lot of short notice. So that's it. Let's go into questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Whitney. And I think, Fawn, that we were gonna wait until um, the end maybe to take some more questions that we wanted and Got it. yeah i think we're going to hold questions to the end so we can make sure we get through everything on today's call yeah but thanks so much whitney uh and next we have ashley perkinson with perkinson law firm and also our wonderful lobbyist here at nc child who's going to talk to us a little bit about the legislative outlook here in north carolina related to this all right thank you adam can everyone hear me okay very good. And I just have to say, Whitney, that was the best overview of the CARES Act that I have heard or seen. So thank you for that excellent overview. Very thorough. Um, so, so yeah, so the, the North Carolina General Assembly, I do have several updates. Uh, the short session as of now is still scheduled to move forward on April 28th. Uh, currently, there is no plan. There are no plans to hold a special session. That, of course, could change. Uh, but they are scheduled to go for their short session, April 28th. Um, an interesting point there as well. They are required to vote in person. So I think that they will be looking at ways to hold the session, but but do it in a way that also looks out for the health and safety of the legislators and the staff. Uh, so looking forward to that April 28th short session convening date. In the meantime, there have been a number of working groups uh, that have been set up and are meeting uh, just uh, a little over a week ago, Speaker Moore announced the creation of the House Select Committee on COVID-19 and set up four working groups. Uh, those working groups are the Health Committee, uh, the Education Committee, uh, the edu uh, in, uh, Economic Support Committee, and also a, a, a committee that's looking at the continuity of government operations. Three of those four working groups have met. Um, something unique about these working groups uh, that I think is a, a very positive sign, these are bipartisan working groups. So the chairs, we've got both Republican and Democrat chairs of these working groups. And uh, during both the health care 
uh, Working Group Committee and also the Economic Support Working Group Committee, Speaker Moore did present uh, to those uh, Working Group Committee members and went through the objectives of the Working Groups and then also gave a uh, a lay of the land of the uh, the economic uh, health of the state and what we are looking at as far as funds in reserve. And he went through the, those amounts. Uh, we've got 3.9 billion in the uh, employment trust fund, 1.1 billion in savings uh, reserve for rainy day funds, 2.2 uh, .2 billion unappropriated funds. So that will be cash on hand. 184 million in Medicaid contingency reserve funds and 74 million for re disaster relief funds. So a uh, significant amount of funds that would be available. However, one important thing to keep in mind with the extension of both the state and federal uh, tax filing deadlines, we will likely see a shift in the revenues coming into the state. So that could impact uh, the uh, appropriation numbers that we will be looking at for the next fiscal year. Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind as well. Um, I do want to mention on the General Assembly's website, there is a link for uh, comments from the public. And it looks like that if you print it out. Uh, but uh, so anyone can uh, email the working group members and those comments will be submitted to those various working groups. And again, this is the, the House Select Committee on COVID-19. The Senate as of yet has not set up uh, a, a similar committee. Uh, we don't know if that will be in the works or if that will happen before the short session. Uh, just briefly would like to go over some of the highlights from the health working group. Uh, the, the health working group really focus on um, hospital needs and in uh, the, the needs of the, the healthcare providers right now. Of course, a uh, large uh, push uh, and, uh, and focus on the need for personal protective equipment and looking at the shortages across the state uh, for PPE. Um, we had the, the chair of the North Carolina Healthcare Association present uh, both the chair and the, the head of government relations. Um, they called for a, a statewide shelter in place. They also spelled out uh, their legislative asks for this coming uh, short session and also for the working group committees. I will mention Representative Dobson did say that this working group will result in legislative recommendations. So they are looking at that. If you want to go online and look at the full list of the legislative recommendations by the Healthcare Association. And the Healthcare Association is what used to be called the Hospital Association, for those who may be more familiar with their formal title. You can go on the ncleg.gov website and, and click on the House Select Committee for COVID-19 uh, to pull up the information from those working groups and to see the full presentations. Uh, Chip Baggett from the Medical Society also presented. Um, and one of the things that he mentioned uh, is looking at just the uh, economic well-being of uh, physician groups across the state. And uh, something that was mentioned that I think was an interesting point with, with doctors and medical groups postponing a lot of the elective or non-urgent services, that that creates a financial hit. Uh, and uh, the Medical Society did put forward a long list of uh, recommendations, including, uh, of course, looking at uh, more flexibility for, for telehealth uh, services. Um, and those full list of recommendations, that list can be found as well on their presentation, which is included uh, in, in the working group's website. Oh, one interesting thing I do want to mention, they did not get to the presentation by uh, NC, Le NC legislative staff, Deborah Landry, uh, but there's a terrific chart that she has put together that's also on that committee website that outlines all the federal legislation. They're going to meet next Thursday. This health working group will meet next Thursday, and she will be the first presenter to go through all of the, the federal bills. Uh, again, that chart is, is on the website. Hopefully by Thursday, it will be updated to include uh, the CARES Act uh, and, and that information. But they, the House Working Group on Health is really wanting to digest everything that's going on on a federal level uh, to help inform what they do 
on the state level. But again, they are looking at recommending legislation in that working group. Uh, just want to give a brief update as well on the education working group. Uh, Jeff Coltrane, he is the governor's senior education advisor. He presented about uh, of course, the impact of the school closure um, now to mid-May. It was an interesting point that he made. One of the reasons they picked that date is that it is eight weeks out from the first report of community spread of COVID-19. So there was some uh, interesting uh, background and thought in, in deciding on that date. Um, he also mentioned that on uh, March 24th, the gover Governor Cooper announced a $50 million uh, fund that will go to the school districts across the state. Um, and that is, uh, that will be used for everything from nutrition services, emergency childcare, distance learning, and also cleaning services for the school to make sure um, that uh, we're able to uh, keep those schools uh, in, in good shape. Um, there was a question asked by one of the legislators, uh, Representative Elmore, I believe, asked um, what will be the tracking for the $50 million funds in relief. Uh, and Jeff mentioned that they will actually use codes to track um, those funds, how they go to the districts. But that will, those funds will go, uh, there will be a special allotment formula. That is not a fund where the districts will request the funding, um, but it will be affirmatively uh, dispersed two districts throughout the state uh, uh, to help with those areas that I just mentioned. And then uh, briefly also uh, Freebird McKinney um, on behalf of the State Board of Education uh, gave an update as well. His full uh, presentation is also available on that website. Um, interesting point that he mentioned in waiving the uh, EOCs and EOGs, he said that's not really uh, something that will take legislative action. However, there are so many laws on the book that use data from those end of course and end of grade tests, including um, promotion from third to fourth grade, performance, school performance grades, school report card grades, uh, various teacher bonus programs, that they're really going to have to look at those statutes uh, and uh, revise in order to provide some flexibility. Obviously, the concern about the, the school calendar law and looking at the need to, to make that law more flexible. Now, this uh, working group, the education working group that met yesterday did focus, at least at this meeting, on K through 12, uh, but are open to um, uh, looking at expanding uh, that focus, of course, to um, K through 12 colleges and universities and also um, early education. So hopefully we will see some of those topics uh, being addressed in uh, this education work group. And with that, uh, those were the main updates from, from the legislature. I think we will see uh, these working groups continue to meet. They, they met uh, via teleconference, uh, video conference, and e there were a couple of minutes of hiccups, <laughs> um, just trying to get all the legislators on, but they actually ran pretty smoothly. And, and I think we'll see a pretty aggressive meeting schedule from those four working groups in the coming weeks before the short session starts end of April. Thanks so much, Ashley. Really appreciate it. And thanks for staying on top of, of a quickly evolving situation. And there's just, it's all, it's overwhelming all the things that the legislators now also are going to have to think through on this. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look forward to, to keeping everyone on this call posted uh, moving forward. Um, so now I just wanted to very quickly go through some of the recommendations that we at NC Child have been thinking about and come up with from a legislative advocacy front. And um, before, and so I'm gonna try to go through this really quickly because we're running up on time on our call and we wanna leave a few minutes for questions. But I think the main thing to know is that we're gonna send out this letter for review by 9 a.m. on Monday. What I'm about to do is just go over a few of the highlights. We're gonna send that out to everybody on the call, everybody in our network, so you'll have an opportunity to do look at this, review it, and we encourage you to please sign on as an organization to these recommendations if that is something that you 
feel like you are willing to do and your organization is willing to do. And we're gonna have a quick turnaround on this, but we hope by reviewing it for a few minutes today, that helps lay the groundwork. And then we're gonna have a, a deadline of, of Tuesday at five o'clock, but we're hoping to get as many orgs signed on as possible. So now um, moving forward and talking about this, the first thing we wanted to just mention again, a layout, as y'all know, there's legislative versus administrative actions that are being taken in response to uh, this pandemic. And that's happening at the federal level and the state level. So what we're trying to do is try to sift through, you know, what's administrative, what's legislative, et cetera. To be honest, if you look at it as a whole, I think there's probably a lot more administrative advocacy and things happening on that front even than legislative. When you look at the flexibility that agencies are being given to implement programs, make changes and modifications as they need to. And so we're just, we just wanted to sort of lay this overview out because um, we're obviously doing advocacy on, on many fronts at the same time. And so this slide kind of goes through that. The other thing I'll throw in is there's also local advocacy to an extent, as some localities do have some powers to do things like um, shelter in place and other responses to this. But this will be shared with you all after uh, the webinar. And so this, this is just something you might find helpful as well. So Fawn, let's move on into the specifics. So we've got some, some big buckets that we wanted to go through and those are health and early ed, which Michelle will help go through, financial security, child welfare and juvenile justice. On the health front legislatively, first and foremost, we continue to ask the state legislature to take action to expand Medicaid in North Carolina, cover the uninsured. This is going to become even more of a crucial issue uh, with the onset of this pandemic. Um, and we know that for community health reasons, the health of families and their children, that this makes more sense than it ever has. And so we will continue to be asking for expansion. There was a letter that many of your orgs signed on by 158 organizations asking uh, to close the coverage gap. And that's gone into the state health committee along with others. Um, in addition to that, I just wanted to note one administrative thing um, that's important, and, and Sarah Vadrine on our staff and others have been pointing this out. Due to the federal legislation that's been passed, no one can be disenrolled from Medicaid during this national emergency, um, period is kind of the way we read it. So situations that might trigger disenrollment will not be considered until this national emergency is lifted, such as the 60-day postpartum uh, situation for women on Medicaid, others that, uh, you know, due to income, et cetera, there's no disenrollment during this period. So that's something that we want to stay on top of and make sure is being implemented correctly. Okay, Fawn. Early ed. Um, so this again is where we're working hand in hand with the North Carolina Early Education Coalition and many other advocates. Um, and they have a sign on that for this, specifically for this emergency economic support package that we encourage all of you all to also take a look at. We will share with everyone if you haven't seen that. And they are encouraging sign ons for that as well. The bottom line is that the child care industry needs a lot of help, a lot of support. Uh, if it's going to, you know, make it through in a lot of ways, this pandemic. And that some of that support's happening at the federal level, but a lot more of it needs to happen at the state. And so, for example, you know, there's this number of $125 million uh, for a package that would help sustain the child care sector during and after this crisis. And there's a lot of other um, kind of details in that package. Michelle, I don't know if you want to mention, you know, any more about this. No, I just, the only thing I would add is this information is all on the um, North Carolina Early Education website. It'll be up on our website. We really encourage everybody to sign on to this. This money is really emergency money to bolster the child care industry during this pandemic. Um, it's, we are looking at much more bigger economic bailout packages. That's sort of part two. Um, I think once we get on the other side of, of the pandemic. So I will leave it there just in terms of time. Okay, so very quickly moving on to financial security. Again, working with lots of partners, there's things that are needed there. All of this is gonna be included in the sign-on letter and everyone is encouraged to provide your feedback 
have things like funding for emergency food access, investing in technological capacity, um, which, which will be very meaningful during this time. Um, the next slide has a couple other things, Ac increasing access to broadband internet. You know, the broadband gap is even more uh, significant during a time like this, and we really need to do whatever we can to make sure people have access to broadband. And also closing some loopholes in benefit access uh, is something that the legislature can do to make sure that we're taking care of folks during this pandemic. Um, next, we've got the, the area of child welfare and juvenile justice. Again, um, we're asking for uh, money to support technological uh, supports to enable virtual visitation and virtual court hearings, uh, tools for social workers, include, and also foster families to utilize during this period of social distancing. We also want to prevent foster placement disruptions by pro providing some additional direct cash assistance for foster families who uh, are we know are going to be impacted along with everyone else. Uh, and then on the juvenile justice front, you know, we really feel strongly like you that you should not be incarcerated at this point in time unless, you know, it's absolutely necessary um, from a community safety standpoint. And so um, looking at any type of solutions we might be able to work on legislatively there, we're certainly interested in and looking for ideas and also uh, funding needed for telehealth access for uh, youth in community programs and incarcerated youth and others. We know that that is also very important during this time so that we can continue to provide the much needed services for juveniles. Um, so again, that's a basic overview. We obviously zipped through that, um, but we're gonna be sharing the legislative recommendations letter, the full letter with everyone uh, by 9 a.m. on Monday. Uh, and then, you know, asking you all to sign on and uh, for your good input and questions, et cetera, in the meantime, okay? Adam, do you want to review how people can send us um, their comments if they have other legislative asks that we forgot to include in this letter? Yes, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, of course, putting your questions in the chat box here, we will be able to um, tabulate those. But also, if you would like to send an email to Eva uh, on our staff, Eva Bannock at eva at nchild.org, she is also um, going to be gathering um, that that feedback and um, you know can can get that in the mix as we look through this through the weekend because after all what's a weekend anymore um, so uh, let's see do we have so we, we have a little bit we have a few minutes here seven or eight minutes uh, fawn do we have any addition do we have any questions or comments Yes, I think we do have more questions in the chat box. I'm scrolling through to see what we haven't okay. answered yet. Um, so first of all, any resources, links, websites, sign on letters that we mentioned on this call are all cataloged on NC Child's COVID-19 website. And I just put the link for that up on your screen. Um, and to make sure that you get notifications about these calls and future updates, you can email eva at nchild.org to get included. So everything we've mentioned today will be up on that site. Today's call was recorded and we'll be posting um, this webinar on that same website and a Spanish version will be up there as well by 5 p.m. today. So just wanted to make sure everyone had that information. Um, we had a question from Jamaica. Have we heard how they're identifying how many children are in the home for the one-time payment? And that's talking about the federal bill. Whitney, I think that's a question for you. What about kids that are in foster care? Will the foster home receive it or would it go to the birth parent? Yes, so it looks like Lamine might have already written back a response here, but um, her understanding is mine as well, that um, they're identifying children through tax returns. So foster homes would not receive the payment for children in their care. We're trying to confirm this right now and then um, are also requesting cash assistance for foster homes who may not qualify for these stimulus payments so that they do get some additional compensation for the care of those kids. Great, and we had a question from Greg, which I don't know if we have the answer to about whether the additional pay to early childhood teachers would be excluded from eligibility limits for other programs and services that those teachers may access. Mm. 
And I don't think we have an answer to that yet, but we're working on it. Okay, great. I believe, I believe I heard that it will be, but let us dig into that. Great. Um, and Myra says she missed the first part of the call. What she was on another, what's happening at four? At four o'clock today, the governor will have a live press conference and we're going to get some more policy updates. So um, Matt mentioned it several times, so I feel like it must be important and everyone should tune in. Um, and any new policy um, orders, closures, executive orders, guidances from DHHS will all be linked on this website that's up on your screen right now. Yeah, the, as we, the, I want to just um, say one thing as we're kind of coming to the close, and I know that there might be some more questions. Um, so as we go through what is a, you know, I think the word unprecedented has been used more in the past two weeks than I think I've ever heard it used before, but a time of incredible uncertainty, incredible hardship, I think, is what um, we are seeing already. And we have not yet peaked in terms of infection and the stress on the healthcare system and the stress on families and kids. And so from an advocacy perspective and from NC Child's perspective and all the folks on the call who do this work, both providing services to kids and families and advocating for kids and families, the next couple months are critical for folks to speak up. We need legislators who are stepping into the kind of leadership that our kids and families need. This is not business as usual in North Carolina. We are in a completely different time and the, the kind of leadership that we need cannot be the kind of leadership that we have seen in the past. It's going to have to be exceptionally collaborative, visionary, courageous, and compassionate. And so we really need everyone to be joining with us in calling on our legislators to provide that kind of leadership with the governor and with other elected officials in the months ahead, because our kids and our families and uh, we are all depending on it. So this is a marathon, y'all. I know it has felt like a crazy sprint the past two weeks, and it has been, and I think deep breath, and it's going to be a long, long, long year. And so we need to take care of ourselves, take care of each other. And again, in the coming weeks, call on our legislators to provide the kind of leadership that we need in North Carolina for kids and families. And so we will work with our partners to try to call that out. Um, we would love it if you will join us in calling for that as well. Um, and we'll be providing communication and structure and opportunities to do that in the days ahead. So thank you for being part of um, all of this work. And we are really looking forward to con continuing to partner with you all um, in the days ahead. As we said at the last call, our lines are always open. Just email. We got a ton of great emails from last week's call. Lots of good information about what's happening in the community. We passed it along to folks um, in different coalitions. We passed it along to the state. Keep it up. Um, we always don't know what's happening at the local level, and we need you all to tell us. So thanks again for all your good work. And Adam, I will stop talking and turn it back to you. Oh, no, well said, Michelle. You know, one, one thing, of course, we're asking for sign ons to this letter and other things, but, you know, it, just following up on Michelle's words about us needing leadership. Hey, write a letter to the editor to your local paper if you've got a minute this weekend saying just that, like it's time for strong leadership and we expect it, basically. Um, I just want to lift off. up the, the last question we've got in the chat box here from our friend Sorian Schmidt at the Z Smith Reynolds Foundation. She's asking, what do you and your partners need to take care of yourselves? Um, I think that's a question for everybody on this call. Um, it can be hard to find out what's happening locally. So before we wrap, um, please, if you have um, information or requests to share in the chat box, please go now, we're recording the chat box.
box too and sharing that back. Um, and we invite you to email us back. Um, you can respond to the email we'll send you out today with the updates from this call. You can also email us directly. You see Eva's email address up there on the screen right now and we'll make sure that we're sharing that back with Sorian and with, and with all of our other partners. Um, but we are very, very grateful for each of you and for our funders and for all that you all are doing. Absolutely. And um, thanks for joining us for a full hour of updates here. We'll be sending out, um, you know, information as Fawn mentioned. Don't hesitate to be in touch with us and stay well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.